Hello listeners, this is Adam, and today I'm interviewing John Smart, who is a developmental systems theorist who studies accelerating change, computational autonomy, and the singularity. He is the president of Accelerating Studies Foundation, a non-profit community for research, education, consulting, and selected advocacy of communities and technologies of accelerating change. He also presented a talk at the first Singularity Summit at Stanford in 2006. He is the author of Acceleration Watch, which is formerly Singularity Watch, which was first founded in the late 90s, which deals with writings of, on accelerating change, evolutionary development, the technological singularity and future studies. And he is an advisor in future studies and forecasting at the Singularity University. So, well, first of all, um, tell us what you do, John. I'm a uh, technology futurist. So I look at where change is going uh, in the technology space and some of the social, political, economic impacts of that. Um, I've been doing it for about 10 years. 10 years. And you had um, Singularity Watch as a, a website early in the... Uh, 2000s or late 90s, is that correct? Yeah, Singularity Watch was my uh, first website discussing accelerating change from a universal or a global perspective, uh, accelerating technological change. And I think it was the first one on the planet that focused on that. And If you ever saw the header of my uh, website, it has a little black hole in the right-hand corner. And The um, radical idea that I had at the time was that um, uh, as change goes faster, um, the systems that process uh, change get more uh, compactified in space, uh, time, energy, and matter. Uh, more dense, what I call stem compression. So increasing stem density, space, time, energy, and matter, and increasing stem efficiency of computation or physical transformation. And so if you extrapolate that out, the most advanced systems start to look more and more like a black hole, which is very interesting because if we continue on that trend, uh, a system that is more and more dense um, is uh, in many ways more and more protected from the uh, fluctuations of the environment. So it's like almost like the universe is packaging up its intelligence into uh, more and more localized, highly resilient uh, structures. And you can pretty much say that's what the transition from biology to technology is. If you have a technological self, you've obviously got it backed up zillions of times and uh, it has many new capability. Uh, it has many new um, um, capabilities and resiliences that you don't see in biological systems. Um, you've talked about intelligence being modeled from biological systems. What do you mean by that? When we, when we think about how technology is, as Ray Kurzweil would say, transcending our biology, um, perhaps it's more accurate to say technology is being modeled after biology. It's being more and more biologically inspired. Um, and I think that's very exciting because humans are the most complex thing in the known universe so far. 100 trillion unique synaptic connections here in this three pound piece of electromagnetic meat and um, if technology can gain that kind of uh, um, complexity um, uh, there's a whole lot of interesting things it could do with it. Um, there's limitations in the biology obviously. Um, well, there's efficiency so we uh, use 100 watts in our brains to do all of this incredible higher order thinking and, and, and consciousness that we have. We don't have any machines that are anywhere near as efficient for energy yet. Um, but as they become more biologically inspired, I think they will go in that direction. Um, and so what uh, we see with uh, as the benefits of biology that technology doesn't have, uh, we can take those as designers and engineers as, uh, as challenges to try and figure out how to uh, implement them in our technology. And as the technology becomes more like biology, uh, it's able to do more things more naturally in ways that uh, fit with human beings um, 
also in more socially acceptable ways. This drive that we have to make humanoid robotics, for example, uh, we'd rather have a machine, an intelligent machine that looks something like us, that we can relate to using the social um, gestures and uh, um, evolutionary psychology that we've currently got. And um, a machine that's more like a human is more multi-purpose. You know, it takes uh, maybe 300 robots and maybe 300 uh, robot polishers, as uh, Tom Friedman would say, to make a Lexus today. But roll that forward 20 or 30 years and you won't have 300 robots on the assembly line. You'll have uh, maybe 30. And they'll be more and more multi-purpose. So you can reuse those servos for more and more things. Uh, each robot becomes more flexible, more uh, capable of uh, doing many different things, more intelligent, more adaptable, more biologically inspired. And that's the direction, obviously, we want to go. And we can see the far, far future where you've got your one Unimate, your totally universal robot that's able to do just about anything for you. And that's pretty much what a human being is. As uh, I think it was Robert Heinlein said, specialization is for insects. Uh, and so as our machines are insect-level intelligence, they're going to be highly specialized. But as they get more advanced, they're going to become more like us. And uh, that's something we we aspire to in our technology. So the von Neumann architecture that's prevalent in computing today, you think it's not really enough to get us there um, with artificial intelligence. We need a more um, distributive approach or parallel approach. So, yeah, if we correct? look at the history of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, it was, you know, um, there was a lot of really great uh, big picture visionary thinking and claims in the 60s, uh, you know, in the Herbert Simon uh, Newell era, uh, Alan Newell. Um, but um, we went into an AI winter in the 70s and 80s because of all the overpromise and because uh, the machines that we were using, the von Neumann architecture, the symbolic based approach, um, rule based approach, even with Bayesian. Um, probability added, it's not very biologically inspired. It's not the way we think. We don't do Bayesian priors in our head to uh, make a decision. So we do something more intricate and interesting that we're still in the process of decoding that's highly associational. And uh, computational neuroscience uh, is going to help us there. Um, imaging is going to help us. Uh, cellular molecular biology, developmental biology. Uh, genomics, proteomics, connectomics, as our uh, sciences of uh, human computation get better, we'll understand how to make a more biologically inspired machine, and that's very exciting. I would say Watson, going up against um, the two best Jeopardy players a few months back um, and beating the pants off of them, uh, basically, did that using something that is a significant step beyond the uh, rule-based symbolic uh, way of doing AI. It was it's, uh, machine learning algorithms uh, working with a statistical um, graph network-based um, type of AI, associational AI, um, connecting up tens of millions of web pages and looking for patterns in a network-like structure that's uh, weakly similar to the way we think our brain works with uh, networks and heavy and learning and these associational weighted synaptic networks. Uh, it's not strongly biologically inspired, but it's certainly a big step forward from what we had in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And I believe that type of architecture that we saw with Watson is probably the next generation of the web. It's the next level beyond PageRank, which Google uses, which is a very weakly biologically inspired as well. Um, but it has these additional features of, of uh, feedback and uh, uh, just a, a huge amount of um, uh, kind of an algorithmic core and a huge amount of, uh, of uh, kind of statistical corpus of knowledge that is, it is um, um, discovering. And it's really, it was almost cute watching Watson learn, like a, like, a, like a baby, and watching Watson make a mistake on Toronto, if you remember that famous mistake where um, 
Watson thought Toronto was in um, the United States. And everybody chortles, oh, ho, ho, ho. Well, it turns out there's like 13 Torontos in the United States. And there's probably only one in Canada. And Watson just wasn't smart enough to recognize that the one in Canada, because it's almost a fifth of the population of Canada, was statistically more important than the 13 little tiny Torontos in, uh, in the United States. So just add a few little bits more kind of associational intelligence, the proper weightings, if you will, in the network, and the system just gets smarter and smarter and is more uh, like, um, like a, uh, a living organism. And I think uh, the science of connectomics is going to uh, do that for us, being able to understand how every neuron connects to every other neuron in a developing and a developed brain and a learning brain. Uh, which I think is going to come out of uh, um, the imaging and the electron microscopy and the automated circuit tracing um, uh, tools that are now moving into the neurosciences and neuro neuroinformatics. Um, I think that's going to be really exciting. So we'll go to a world where um, we have these weekly... Um, mammalian intelligent um, simulations in hardware and or in software of these simple mammals that have all these higher order features like uh, morality, um, pair bonding, um, pack relations. Um, I could see a world where perhaps 20 years from now where we've instantiated these connectomics maps into these into these more strongly biologically inspired AIs and we're uh, we're pruning them we're domesticating them we're artificially selecting them just like we've done with animals for 10 15,000 years and I, I like to say that uh, you and I can trust our dogs and cats with uh, small babies. We can leave the room with them, uh, almost every breed, and with the breeds that we can't, we know which breeds those are. And that's just because we've had these maybe 1,000 selection cycles, 10,000 years of uh, just selecting the ones that are more emotionally symbiotic with us. And I think we'll do that with our AIs. And their brains are going to be just as much a black box as the brains of these domesticated animals. But we'll trust them because we'll have a previous history of interactions with them. And it'll be ethical to iterate various versions of them and select on them because they're not going to be human level. Uh, just like we can do experiments on, uh, on, on, on mice, and if, if, if uh, the uh, subjects, ethics subjects committees think we'll learn something from it, we'll be able to turn off a, a simulated mouse brain without an ethical question of whether we're killing it or whether it's worth killing it. And we will be killing it, right? But we won't be killing it in anything like the sense of a biological organism where all of that unique knowledge is lost in a technological system, as Kurzweil and others say, Moravec, a lot of information can be backed up. So you really aren't killing it, you're just uh, archiving it. So I think we're going to go to a world that's really exciting, where we have complicated, uh, near biological models in our robots, in our drones in our um, platforms, uh, search uh, platforms, uh, and we'll relate to them in ways that are, um, let's say, game theory proven to work with collectives, large numbers of human beings. And so I'm, I'm quite optimistic, as uh, Matt Ridley would say in The Rational Optimist, that collectives of human beings are pretty stable, pretty resilient. They will police their moral deviance um, well. There's only a tiny fraction of them that will be moral deviants. And so if you think about all of the games we play, the moral games we play, the algorithms, um, what um, my friend Werner Vinge might call uh, the um, gold, meta golden rules, um, what are the meta-golden rules that are baked into our genes? Well, we have many of them. Uh, one example is, uh, uh, I will try and trust my fellow humans first, 
but I try and verify. And if I catch them cheating, I will kick that person not out of the tribe, typically, but to the curb. I kick them to the edge of the tribe, and then I watch them closely for the next round. And if they are repentant, if they are penitent, if they want to try and change their behavior and, and get back in, then I let them slowly back in. And so that's a, that's a meta golden rule that almost every society, every uh, robust society uses. And if you don't have that, if you kick them right out, of the, right out, then all your rule breakers very quickly get kicked out of your society. You get these homogenized societies that don't learn. So uh, we want rule breakers. We want people that are uh, continually experimenting. And yet, we have these algorithms that we are baked into our genes that uh, help us, uh, that give us moral instincts. Uh, moral sentiments, as uh, Adam Smith would say, that are highly positively some game theoretic. So they increase the size of the pie, they increase the strength, of the interdependence, the intelligence, and the immunity or resiliency of the system. And I think that we all have to each make up our own mind about that, just how much of that immunity, how much of that interdependency is uh, is in any complex system, uh, and if there's not enough of it, then there's catastrophes that are waiting to happen. So we need to get smart enough to recognize that in biological systems, in ecologies, in cultures, and in technologies. And the better we get at gardening that and jumping on top of the uh, um, self-balancing, self-organizing features of a system, and uh, you know, giving them report cards and putting more energy and effort and uh, resources into improving the immunity of those systems, uh, the better we'll be prepared for all of the disruptions that are going to come, the negative the sides of the disruptions. I've had uh, cats before in my life and I don't, if, I, if I was shrunk like Alice was in, in the rabbit hole to maybe three quarters of my size, maybe even an eighth of my size, I, I don't know if I'd stand a chance hoping. <laughs> I think they'd attack me and possibly even eat me. Yeah, and that's probably really valuable that, um, you know, think for a second about the, uh, the value of having both cats and dogs in your, uh, uh, as um, uh, surrogates for um, relationships between human beings. Cats are highly independent. Um, cats are, uh, we've all heard of cat herding, you know, uh, kind of the chaos that's involved in, uh, in uh, interacting with a cat. Cats are uh, less intelligent on the, uh, uh, I'm going to offend a lot of cat, cat uh, people here, but they're, you know, they're less, um, they're less intelligent. In, they're less intelligent in terms of re, um, the way they, the, the depth at which they model the other actors in their environment. They're more instinctual, more intuitive, uh, more uh, if you might call playful on that on that level. Dogs are much more constrained. They they know what the appropriate behavior is. They follow the hierarchies. They look for the lead animal, and yet that's a valuable skill too. And I think we're you know we need both of those kinds of of, uh, of uh, models of thinking in ourselves, and we need them in our animals. Um, and I think that uh, if we get a uh, cat that um, a cat AI is the first to wake up, uh, that might be a problem if there's only one AI. But if there's multiplicities of, of cats, then the cats are going to have to figure out a social relationship with each other. They're going to have to figure out how to um, um, police their moral deviance and, and, and uh, uh, how to come up with a, a cooperative. And uh, just like there are highly social cats, a good example are ragdoll cats, another good example are the, uh, the sphinx cat, uh, the Cornish, Re Cornish rexes also. Uh, 
So these are exceptions in the cat world, but um, very, very highly social and oriented to the pack. Um, we're going to have to have AIs that do exactly that, or we will shut them off. And if my intuition is right, we're going to get those kinds of cats very quickly selected out of the system, even if they start out with a very non-social orientation. Uh, that's what makes uh, movies like um, Aliens, or uh, the Ridley Scott Alien and Aliens uh, uh, movies, so uh, interesting because they're semi-plausible. Imagine the first insect-like intelligence that emerges. Insects don't make much compromise. They're not very socially oriented. They're just going to throw enough, you know, ants at the at the thing until they finally die enough, and they'll make a cold calculation of whether or not that, you know, they'll do anything more. Um, very much focused on their own models, very brittle relative to... Uh, there's no insect politics as... Uh, Jeff Goldblum famously says in the movie The Fly, the remake, which I highly recommend. Um, but if you think about that, if machines are learning at millions of times faster than uh, biological systems, they're going to go through their their insect politic, their insect uh, apolitical phase, extremely briefly before they shift into a social phase. If we're selecting for sociality for selecting for moral uh, interchange uh, and moral sentiment. And so that might be weeks, months, uh, where you have these first insect level AIs emerging and, you know, if you were being very rash and unforesighted about it, you'd let your little first emerging insect level intelligence run your ICU grid or, you know, talk to your missiles or whatever, and it'd only be one of them. And that would be, you know, highly um, irresponsible. But the reality is, there's going to be bunches of them, and they're going to emerge in a sandbox, like uh, social safety net. Yes, some some place where you can pull the plug if there's things you don't like. And uh, you know, we might not let these things run our ICU networks, but we're sure going to let them keep making our products, right? Pumping out all of our uh, our industrial robotics. So, as long as we think we can pull the plug, and we can on them when they're simple, we'll breed them up for safety. And there's plenty of really good examples of that today already. Uh, Ron Arkin at the Georgia Institute of Technology, uh, one of the pioneers of the ethical architecture concept. Um, I think he sold to the Department of Defense that if you have a Predator drone that has a Hellfire missile in it, uh, Today, this uh, Hellfire missile can be fired by the operator, or the remote operator of the drone, and the commanding officer has to sign off on that. And Ron sold them on the idea that the machine should also have an, uh, a say in that ethical decision. So the machine has very, very primitive ethics. Uh, it basically has a uh, uh, some subroutines that allow it to uh, predict the confidence that there will be little collateral damage. And under cir circumstances where the machine's fuzzy logic or whatever it's using can't tell it with high confidence that the collateral damage will be pretty limited, the machine is going to uh, say, no, I don't think you should fire me. You know, And that's the kind of a world we want to move to. Now, that's very weakly biologically inspired machine today. But we will definitely, if you know, the AI people that, that I talk to uh, all right, we'll definitely move to a world where the machine will be speaking to us and it'll be showing us its confidence intervals just like uh, Watson showed his three confidence intervals and they can just slide the bars differently in the, in the Watson Jeopardy uh, um, um, television show that we saw recently. Um, and so we'll have a dialogue with them and we will feel uh, uh, that they are considering all the options that we consider, also consider to be important, and if they aren't, uh, we'll design that in. I'd consider the Watson match at Jeopardy um, as a, a mini Sputnik moment, and a few people got interested in AI because of it. Yeah. Do you th what do you predict will be the next um, breed of Sputnik moments that'll get people um, sort of aware that AI is creeping up behind us and 
is uh, gaining traction? Well, there's a number of them. Uh, you know, when when you get facial recognition uh, that really works, when you get um, predictive algorithms that uh, um, are able to figure out uh, what your interests are, that really work. Um, machine vision, um, business analytics, um, theorem proving for some people, machines being able to uh, discover new things in the mathematical space. Uh, for each person, there's a different set of things. Oh, drug design. Um, machines getting smart enough to figure out, uh, not necessarily the full protein folding problem, which is pretty pretty complicated, but but uh, kind of haptin antigen other you know, interactions at the molecular scale and, and start to understand from uh, uh, from 1D from primary structure and protein kind of how the 2D and then uh, the 3D um, um, interactions are going to occur and be able to look um, uh, for unique um, efficiencies and, and, and catalytic pathways that are sitting there waiting patiently for us to go smart enough to see in, in, in the, in the uh, space of the, of, the, uh, of the cell. So there's a lot of really interesting things machines are getting better and better at and I think for each person there's a different Sput Sputnik moment. I, I have to agree with you. I think Watson was a Sputnik moment in the sense that uh, uh, it surprised us and helped us all of a sudden see just how close this conversational web is. And I, you know, I've written the conversational interface in 2003, where I argue sometime between 2012 and 2019, we're going to feel that the web, we can talk to the web. And that's because we have a doubling time of the average query length that we do to the web of, um, uh, every seven years, and have had since 1998 with Alta Vista. Um, so Alta Vista to Page Rant, uh, Alta Vista to Google, right? 1998, 2005. That was a very big, big advance. 2005 to 2012 has been another real big advance. Now we're talking to Google an average of 4.9 words, very close to the 5.2 of 2012 beyond that. But to move from 5.2 in 2012 to 10.4 in 2019, that's that's a very big big change. That's You have emergent grammars coming in, and now you... Uh, there's so much you can do with a conversational interface that has a crude natural language processing ability at that scale. And I think that will be another Sputnik moment where people will be able to talk to these avatars, what I call cyber twins, and feel like there's an intelligence there, even though there isn't. It's just going to be the web, the NLP map. But then that system will be able to start dropping all these primitive personality models of you on top of that. And that's the world, you know, after the 2020s is to me a world where it makes sense to talk to an avatar now and have a digital twin or a cyber uh, butler, cyber secretary, whatever you want to call it. But that thing is really going to have a primitive map of you and your values. And it's going to be able to steer you to other people who have that, those similar values. And that is such a new world. It is so different um, that it's almost like a, a singularity, you know, a, a technological singularity, right? It's a, it's a world where everyone's going to feel naked without the web from that point forward, what I call the symbiotic age. You're going to feel like your values are being looked after. Everyone's going to have a lobby twin, if you will, right? You're going to find other people who have similar interests to you. Uh, Google will be able to take everyone who uses Gmail or any other web archived mail today is a blogger who doesn't know it. All of their valid, all the things they care about are all in all that Gmail, all all the conversation stream that you've written about. Um, or if you use Google Voice or one of those others that you've talked about. Being able to connect you up to other people who have similar interests without 
revealing each other's email or voice streams, just be able to find other people who might want to launch a company on a topic you've been talking about recently, uh, might want to um, buy your product. Um, all that's going to be possible in the conversational interface world, and that is less than 10 years from now. And that is a big Sputnik moment, in my opinion. That's a world where uh, we'll wake up and recognize that the web is the single largest construction project, engineering project, uh, transition that the human being has ever been engaged in. It's not any particular thing like you know AI or, or whatever. It's the whole web. It's the whole distributed intelligent, digital intelligence and the net, uh, all the supporting structures of that of that platform. That's the great pyramids of today. But it makes all the previous great wonders of the world look very small in comparison. And so I think that that process is, as I've said in my, uh, in my writings before, is not an evolutionary one as much as it is a developmental one. Um, it's something that's probably happening on every intelligent planet that has access to technology everywhere in the universe. This is a developmental stage. The global brain, uh, worldwide mind, whatever you want to call it, um, that is happening everywhere there's technology. And I think <coughs> it's built in to the developmental physics of the universe that this happens, this, this acceleration happens. Not necessarily built in that humans survive the transition. There's developmental failures, for example. But as long as we pay attention to the immune systems that are developing along with the, the intelligence, uh, I think we can do a very good job of making the transition in a safe and sustainable way. And it is sustainable, and a lot of people in the green community still cringe at that idea of using sustainable with, you know, sustainable um, with respect to AI and, and accelerating technology. But the reality is every new generation of technology has a smaller ecological footprint per computation or per physical transformation than the previous generation. Humans don't do that. Humans have the same level of impact. And we've been exponentiating our numbers, but that's going to go the other way. I think when you have this cyber twin, this extension of you, it's going to be less and less desire to replicate your biology, as Hans Moravec and others I've mentioned uh, your mind children become more uh, representative of you and you have less interest in making more biological uh, human beings and if you die biologically and you've got this cyber twin that's completing your sentences when you have when you have a senior moment you're going to be less um, uh, stressed about dying in that environment. You're going to feel like there's less of you that's actually dying. As Isaac Asimov said famously, why would I want to freeze myself? I've written 500 books. Uh, you're going to feel fully backed up in a cyber twin type of a world. All the things you care about, all your stories, all your values, they're going to be in your cyber twin. So that's a world where we don't go to tombstones to grieve anymore. We fire up cyber mom and we talk to her. We got all of her stories, her attitudes, we can even change a couple of the faders. If, if mom wasn't quite as good as we liked her in certain areas, we can just kind of dial that down and, and get more towards that ideal. As uh, Tolstoy said, uh, happy families are all alike. Uh, unhappy families are unhappy each in their own way. There's a certain developmental optimum for the way we like to relate to each other, and then there's lots of ways to fall off of that optimum. I think as we move towards a more totally quantified, more intelligent society, what I call the ever smarter world, uh, we're going to figure out more and more easily what that optimum is and we'll be choosing it more in our own lives, we'll be living more quantified lives ourselves and more aware, more self-actualized lives and that's some of the many benefits that I think technology gives us and it, it creeps up on us, it happens in ways that we don't expect because it's happening everywhere. 
I want you to can can you can you explain some of the ways that people will um, like in daily life use this digital symbiont, this digital part like, thing? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so if we think about the cyber twin or uh, the digital twin uh, and how we might use it in uh, the next decade after we had this conversational interface emerge, we're early, early or mid 2020s, let's say, um, and we ask ourselves, what would I want to use that kind of a thing for? Well, like I was saying earlier, you might use it to um, help guide you on all the information you're consuming. You might use it for finding other people who have similar values and interests to you, for uh, suggesting business um, opportunities, for suggesting political statements that you might make. Um, let's think of a couple scenarios. Uh, you're reaching for a can of tuna in 2030. You've had a cyber twin for 10 years now. It's been following all of your blog, blogging, all of your emailing, all of your speaking, because you've been running a life log that's recording all of your, uh, everything you're saying. And these are mostly going to be 20-somethings doing this. You know, they're going to experiment with it and just try it and see. Everyone else might just kind of sit back and wait a few years and see. These things will be completing their sentences when they can't figure out the word that's on the tip of their tongue because it knows them that well, because we're that repetitive. So you might see some seniors using this for that purpose. Right? <laughs> and you're reaching for a can of tuna. 20, 25, whatever. And your cyber twin can whisper in your ear or show you a little green arrow in your augmented reality overlay on your glasses or or maybe you're wearing a, your AR on the back of your hand as a very very tiny OLED um, gauntlet type uh, you know your cell phone is now something you wear here and it just vibrates a little bit to this side and you look down and you see this little arrow that says move over you move your hand a few inches and now you grab the other can of tuna. The reason you did that is because your cyber twins, you know, the machine vision system, the values that are behind that, tells you that that can of tuna, uh, the one you reach to, much more reflects your personal values. Your friends are the, buy that one, the uh, NGOs and the experts that you like to read and listen to like that one better than the other one. And if you want the data, you can ask your cyber twin or you can t tap and, and uh, um, get some of the details and find out that this, you know, uh, tuna A, they're still killing the dolphins, the mercury level's too high, uh, there are certain things uh, that they're doing, social responsibility are a little bit lower than the other guys. But you won't even ask for that data in most cases. So you've just made a decision, a choice, because you've got this neural prosthetic, because this external piece of you that's looking out for your interests. And every single choice you make and what you buy, and all of your political activism, any, any uh, you know, donation you give to some little campaign or any simple you know, letter that your cyber twin sends off or whatever, is all looking after your lobbying and your values. Now that's a world where the network and the individual node in the network becomes so empowered that all the hierarchies, the mountains that are sitting in that network still, and there's two major ones, there's the multinational corporations and then there's the governments that the MNCs have captured over the last 50 years and turned into their, uh, into their proxies, right? Both of those hierarchical systems flatten. And that's the Tom Friedman insight, right? The world flattens, but the hierarchies themselves also flatten as the network empowers. Hierarchies never go away, but what we can say is that the hierarchy of autocracy and the network of democracy are on a pendulum. I call it the political economic pendulum, if you want to Google my article on that. And very, it takes a very long time to switch sometimes from hierarchy to network. And we've had 50 years of swinging 
from previous network models, more, more uh, less uh, rich-poor divide, more uh, democracy in the United States, towards less democracy, more plutocracy, more powerful corporations, much more powerful uh, corporations, uh, much stronger uh, federal government. And now we're going to be able to swing that back again to a world where you have stronger local governments, more direct democracy, more uh, initiative democracy, um, corporations that have to become, and governments have to become much more transparent. And how is that all going to happen? It'll happen because the entire planet's going to be networked. Now, we're not talking 10 years from now. We're talking closer to you know, 15, 20. It's a world where every kid's got a cell phone that they can talk to and learn as fast as their curiosity drives them just by talking to the, to the machine. That's a world where, and, and of course, Google's going to, and every other, uh, other company that's a search company, Bing, Yahoo, whoever's still around at that point, is going to be giving those things away because they're selling location-based ads on the side. So they're, any com company whose business model revolves around openness wants this to empower this network. And so that's a world where the individual now has so much power, so much cognitive assistance to look after their values that we can put the multinational corporations and, their gov and the governments back in the cage of democracy. Think about that. Think about what a big win that's going to be. And you say, John, you're Pollyanna, you're an optimist, that's not going to happen. Well, I can quote you Harvard Business Review case studies that say if 3 to 5 percent of a market disappears because of a decision that some powerful, uh, uh, that some powerful corporation or government did, that can be traced back to a reversible decision that that corporation or government did, they take notice, particularly corporations, right? They take notice. Why? Because there's, they're losing market share. And they will make, they will change their decision. And why will they do that? Because of something uh, in the corporate world called creative destruction, right? So, uh, What's happening in every industry is the little guys, the little to mid-sized guys, are continually raising uh, their market share and eating the big guys at the top. Mergers, acquisitions, um, out competition. And if you as a big corporation aren't watching that little guy and it suddenly moves from 2% to 5% of the market and you don't jump on... Uh, and come up with a counter strategy at that point, uh, history shows, you know, you could be lunch. The next 5% moves to, you know, 25, 50%. Uh, because that's how fast in this modern network world um, a better solution can uh, outcompete uh, not as good of a solution, one that doesn't fit the values of the, of the uh, consumers, right? So I would argue that. The value cosm, as it gets more advanced, will put all the powerful actors, the plutocratic actors, back into that cage. And we'll see a swing back to the kinds of, uh, to, to the more healthy uh, network oriented democracies that we had uh, 50 years ago. Now, 50 years ago, in, Ein in uh, the Eisenhower era, uh, the marginal tax rate at the top was something like 90%. And until very recently in Sweden, the marginal tax rate, individual tax rate at the top, you know, someone who's making several million dollars a year, was something like 75%. And I think recently Sweden uh, lowered it below 75%. And uh, that's just, I think, primarily because of the wealth of the, the, the people, right? The, the, the people, uh, the, the richest people in every society want to keep as much of their wealth as they can. And so what ends up happening is the redistributive models that we originally had, these strong models that keep a strong middle class, 
get captured and we move to a world where uh, there's larger and larger inequities and income divides and um, that is a much less network oriented much less resilient world um, so I think uh, I think that's where we are now and it's going to continue for a while there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of inertia behind increasing rich poor divides and yet books like the spirit level and others give you really good evidence that uh, if you can lower the rich poor divide you increase the strength of the and the productivity of the society and the satisfaction of all the members within the society and uh, you need a certain differential and I think uh, countries like Germany and Scandinavia the differential between the highest and the lowest paid might be something like on the order of 10 and in countries like the United States it might be 200, 300, 500 uh, and I think that kind of uh, those kinds of inequities which a lot of people care very much about uh, can be redressed in a value causing world people are going to have a lot of freedom, a lot of intelligence a lot of spare time if you think the Arab Spring was uh, was something, the recent uh, Facebook-inspired uh, um, de democracy movements we've seen in, in uh, the North African countries and the Middle East, this is just imagine that many orders of magnitude more. All the small decisions that we can make to um, give feedback to con to companies and countries whose policies we don't like. I don't like what's going on in the United States. I can buy my products and services from companies who are uh, from countries uh, whose governments I do like. I can shift my money out of the uh, currency of the countries that I think are irresponsible, even if I'm living in one of those, into a country whose currency I think is much more uh, fiscally soundly managed and is a more transparent country. And this is kind of a sovereign individualism model. This is a world where the value cosm gets stronger. Individuals are going to realize that I don't need so much of a nanny state anymore. I can make my own decisions more and more. And just as the nation state, which has only been around since the peace of Westphalia, a few hundreds of years, is losing power relative to the cities. If you read Richard Florida, the power of the real innovative core of the planet is now these 500 top cities. It's not these 200 countries anymore. Uh, and the corporations, right? Uh, the leading corporations whose uh, incomes are greater than most countries. And that's the problem, isn't it? Uh, 50 years ago, the top 100 revenue generators, maybe 80 of them were countries and 20 were corps. Now it's 80 of them are corporations and 20 are countries. And and that's the single biggest problem, is that the corporations have kind of captured the democracies and made them in service to them. Well, it doesn't matter whether you're a corporation or a, or a country or a city in the value causing world. If you aren't servicing your constituency, you're going to get punished. You're going to get feedback. And that's a very exciting world. Value causum is a world where I'm pissed off that... Uh, Dow Chemical has um, not cleaned up Bhopal, the single largest uh, industrial disaster of the 20th century. It wrote a check of a few hundred. Uh, uh, Dow Chemical bought Union Carbide and is now a subsidiary. And Union Carbide was the one that wrote the check of a few hundred million dollars to uh, India, but they didn't supply any experts. They didn't uh, to help them with their health issues from the Bhopal uh, gas disaster. Uh, and they didn't supply any environmental help to help them deal up, uh, clean up their environmental disaster. So Bhopal is still uh, uh, an open uh, sore, open scab uh, on the planet today, right? A, a junkyard of, uh, uh, of, from, of technological negativity. And I want to make Dow Chemical deal with problem or kick Union Carbide back out of their M&A, um, I can tell my cyber twin in 2020, I'm not going to buy any more Dow Chemical products. I don't care where they are in the supermarket. And I don't need to know where they are anymore. Right? There's no way I could figure that out. 
DAOs in so many different products, but my cyber twin can, and I can pass on that initiative to my friends, and they can do that, and they can keep emailing the DAO PR guys until they finally respond to that. And DAO's just going to watch that response, just click, 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 and get higher and higher until it reaches some threshold, and they have to uh, say uncle. And we'll see more folks like the Yes Men, uh, these beautiful identity correction specialists, or corporate identity correction specialists, they call themselves, and the stunt that they pulled where they got on CNN Europe and pretended to be a DAO, um, a DAO representative saying, yes, we're going to pay $9 billion to clean up uh, Bhopal. And, everybody, and all of a sudden, Bhopal got back on everybody's radar just a few years ago because of that stunt. They couldn't take that knowledge and just tell their cyber twin, hey, this is what I want you to do. That new awareness they had of this unresolved problem. But the media, the internet television bottom-up media of, uh, of uh, the future, which I've written a lot about, right? this coming concept of millions of channels that are all bottom-up, coming through the web, not through this hierarchy of corporate media that we have today. Uh, combined with the intelligence of this uh, digital um, values network that exists on the planet uh, in a world where we have a conversational interface and, and advanced national language processing. Um, all of those things empower the individual. And I think it's, uh, um, it's exciting to see that these things are coming. And there's, there's a lot of downsides particularly with the early versions of these technologies that we haven't talked about. But uh, I think in the long run, they're also extremely empowering.